everyone. This is David Geisler with Norm Geisler International Ministries. Tonight, our NGIM staff, that is Raymond Kwan, Ryan Henson, Thomas McCuddy, and Don Deal and myself are going to discuss a topic that I'm sure that are on a lot of people's minds today, and that is God, evil, and the coronavirus. I'm sure we're all thinking about all of this. Now, I want to invite all of you who are joining us right now, if you have questions or comments uh, about anything regarding this topic tonight, I want you to uh, send those to us in the comment section. Um, and we'll take some time at the very end to answer some of these questions if we can. And if you have any prayer requests, send them to prayer at ngim.org. Um, and if you'd like to partner with us in praying, just go to uh, ngim.org slash prayer dash partners. Hey guys, uh, to begin our discussion tonight, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share a thought uh, to help us frame our discussion. I think this is a very provocative uh, topic. And uh, so I just kind of want to share a thought maybe to help us uh, see the bigger picture and what we're talking about tonight. Uh, some of you may know that John Lennon of the Beatles uh, once recorded a song called Imagine. Now, of course, I don't agree with everything that's said in that song, but there are a few very insightful words in the song that I do agree with. Listen to these words. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Now you may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Certainly we know John Lennon was not the only one who imagined this kind of world. When we look in the New Testament at the very beginning of the church age, we see something similar. In fact, Luke says in Acts 4, 34 and 35, let me read this. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, certainly at the very beginning of the church age, we see a picture of what God had wanted to see from the very beginning, all of us living in harmony with one another, just as John Lennon himself desired to see. Now, if we skip all the way to the end of the Bible, we see a picture what the end of history will look like and what had God had envisioned from the very beginning. And some of you may be familiar with Revelation 21.4. We read that someday God will wipe away all our tears from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. No more coronavirus. So guys, we know from reading scripture that God's plan was that there was a time in the end when there was going to be no more pain, no more suffering, and certainly no coronavirus. And yet one of the major criticisms I hear from atheists and skeptics a lot is, you know, how can there be a God when there's so much evil and suffering in the world right now? So Don, let me just start with you. What what do you think is the false assumption about happiness that many people make about God today as it relates to us? Well, David, thanks for asking. There, there's actually a few false assumptions that people make about God and their happiness. Number one, that the purpose of this life from God's perspective is a maximization of the people's happiness. It's not. It's to know God in truth. And another mistake people often make is that this life is all there is. It's not. There is eternity to consider. 
And uh, the final perspective is, is that this life is the preparation for that eternal life. This is not the eternal life itself. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, I run into this problem a lot when I talk to uh, people about the problem of evil, because there's just this assumption that if God does exist, he's just going to make my life as happy as possible now. Hmm. But if the purpose of life is really to bring the knowledge of God that brings happiness in the next life, then obviously, uh, if that's not God's purpose now, then we can't fault him um, for not making everything happy now. Raymond, how do we handle the charge that some people make that if God is all good, he would destroy evil. If he's all powerful, he would destroy evil. But since evil hasn't been destroyed, there can't be any such God that exists. So let's go into this question. Uh, this question is actually not about whether God exists, but it's about what kind of God exists, right? So the fact is that uh, God did not get rid of evil yet. It does not mean that he's not going to defect evil sometime in any point in the future. So if you say for sure that this assumption that the evil exists now, and you're assuming that you have this knowledge that an all-powerful and all-good God would not dis dis defeat evil in any point on the future. So no one can possess this knowledge unless you have an absolute knowledge of the future about this. And in this case, you have all the knowledge and you are God. Exactly. And in the midst of uh, coronavirus, right, that just paused here, when we face evil in our life, do you not hope that there's an all good and all powerful God who can remove the virus from everybody in the world? Right. So just the thought of this hope, does it point to are all good and all powerful God that everybody wished for. Yes, yes. My dad actually has a clip uh, where he talks about this issue in his debate with Rabbi Kushner. Let's let's look at that clip for a moment. Let me offer a, a suggestion on how that can be done. Usually, it's argued if God is all powerful, He could destroy evil. If he's all good, he would destroy evil, but evil isn't destroyed, therefore there is no such God. Well, I think you can turn that around and argue just the opposite. If he is all powerful, he can do it. If he is all good, he will do it. And the fact that it's not yet done proves that he will one day do it. You can't stop a novel in the second chapter and say, this thing will never turn out. And you can't look at life right in the middle and say, there's no way for this to come out. If there is an all good and all powerful God, he not only can do it, he will do it. And that is your hope and assurance that it will be done. Yeah. This hey guys, uh, what do you think about this clip? Uh, does anyone want to throw in anything here to add? Yeah, I think I, I think that uh, your your dad makes uh, several good points there. Uh, you know, sometimes people say justice delayed is justice denied, but that's not the case when we're talking about a lifetime. That's a, that's a legal case. Uh, justice delayed can be to a higher justice in the result. So your dad makes a very good point there. Thomas, let me go to you. Uh, let me ask another question. Can you explain to all of us, you know, what is the problem that others who do not hold to a theistic perspective have in even trying to wrestle with the question of evil? Maybe you can even start by explaining what a theistic perspective is. Sure, David. So the problem is with the the theistic perspective, which is what we're really talking about is worldviews. And theism is the worldview that the universe and this world was created from nothing by one being that we call God. And uh, this God is not only creator, but he's the sustainer of all the universe. And as well as he's also the source of truth and goodness. So if we don't have that kind of perspective, like an atheistic worldview, for example, uh, literally yesterday, my uh, we were watching, we have the um, the trial of Disney Plus with the lockdown, and uh, we were watching the old Fantasia movie from 1940. There's a very famous little segment in there with dinosaurs, and uh, a lot of people don't realize that before that comes on, the conductor of the symphony begins talking about how science has shown us that, you know, life began as this little microbe and developed over time, and eventually a very overeager fish crawled out of the water. So we're, we're watching this, and uh, 
I asked my son, uh, I, I remember looking at this and saying, uh, if this is true, if, if you know, we watch the earth cool down and we watch this stuff develop, I said, if we're just chemicals reordered, mm -hmm. uh, what does that do for things like good and, you know, bad and evil? He's, he's nine years old and he says, well, you know, without God, there's no, there's no good. You know, like we're just, um, you know, it, it looks like we're just accidents. <laughs> I said, you know, very good. So even my nine-year-old recognized that in, uh, in atheism, if everything is just matter, then there's no real morality. What you end up with is the traditional problem of evil is really only a problem when there is a God in the world. That's what we're trying to figure out. Why is there a good God and why is there evil? If there is no God, the problem you then have is there's not actually evil in the world, that things are as they should be, that coronavirus isn't just another, another virus that's out there. Uh, you end up in a very naturalistic worldview. The, the wolf that eats the rabbit, you know, we don't consider that evil, but I think the rabbit would disagree. And I think that's what happens many times. We find ourselves in the place of the rabbit saying, I don't like this, right. but you can't say it's evil. All you can say is you don't like it. And even Jack London, as he wrote uh, many of his novels and short stories from a naturalistic perspective, that again, not, ha not holding to the idea that there's a creator out there who cares, it's that man is all alone in the world. And humans are, are nothing. People die, life goes on, it ends, it's bleak. And without God, that's all we have, is just the, almost the circle of life, just, just keep going. So a theistic perspective, also, it's not just being optimistic that we're just hoping there's a God so we can console ourselves. Many come to theism because they see evil in the world, that there's something in our heart that cries out that this just ought not to be this way, that it's broken. Uh, and you can't get a broken world unless it was first designed and created to be another way. Just like when you see a tree with a broken branch, you can look at it and you say, well, that's not supposed to be like that. That's not the way a tree should be. Uh, and we don't get any of that concept of should uh, without there being a creator. Pantheism as a, is another perspective that all is God, and you don't get an answer for evil from that either, that if all is God, then whether, it, whether you see something, you call it good, you call it bad, it's all a part of God, it all should be. So then uh, evil is just, you know, an illusion. It is just a matter of perspective, kind of like the wolf and the rabbit. Some are wolves, some are rabbits. You know, all is good. And again, there's something about us that says when children suffer, and this is what I hear all the time, why are children suffering? And that question only makes sense in a theistic world because we know children shouldn't be suffering. Right. And so these notions of right and wrong, of, of evil, only makes sense in a creation. And without theism, I would say we can't even make sense of evil. I think the, the nihilists who say that there's no meaning, no purpose, they tell us that. It was Nietzsche who cried out, you know, that God was dead and it, and it really bothered him. What, what are we gonna do? Right. Uh, and I think a, another question comes out of that is why does he allow all this evil? And, uh, but that's a different, different question to the side. Right. Uh, but I think that's why without God, there's not a problem of evil, but you have bigger problems than you had before. Exactly. Did, did I tell you, Thomas, of the story about the guy on the plane who claimed to be a pantheist and didn't think that there was such a thing as good and evil? And so I said to him, you mean to tell me if I hit you in the face right now, punched you right in the face, that you wouldn't think that I was doing anything wrong and you wouldn't retaliate? And he said to me, well, I would have thought you were out of harmony. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> it's one thing to say you believe that uh, reality is beyond good and evil. It's kind of hard to live that way, though, uh, especially for a pantheist. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, uh, let me go to you for another question. Uh, how do we answer the charge that some are making that uh, the Christian God, that in some sense he's a moral monster, especially the God of the Old Testament? What are... What are they not understanding? What are people not understanding about the God of the Old Testament and, and also God's moral responsibility in general? Right. Popular question. And uh, I would like to say hello to our uh, brothers and sisters 
in Christ from Pakistan that are watching us. Hello to Iftikhar, my, my online friend. Hello to you, your family, and your congregation that NGIM is being watched all over the world. Uh, but this question of, is God a moral monster? Because in the Old Testament, he seems to do things that seem really mean, like flooding the world and the plagues with Egypt and then the destruction of the Canaanites. It's, that's, first of all, it's based on a category mistake, category mistake fallacy, that we're putting God in the same category that we are in. Now, God does not have the same moral obligations that I have as the creator. He is the author of the story. He's in a unique category. It's kind of like I'm a school teacher at, at short Christian school. And when I tell my students to, to be quiet, if they were to say, well, you're talking, I'd say, <laughs> well, I have the authority to talk right now. It, it, so it's not that I'm being a hypocrite. It's that I am talking for their good and they are not talking also for their good. It would be like if somebody broke into my house and they're trying to steal my TV. And I was like, hey, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't steal TVs. And so then I take the guy and then I tie him up in my garage and I say, that's stealing is bad, bad, bad. And I'm going to lock you in here for two months as a punishment for stealing. What's wrong with that? I don't have the authority to do that. It's a category mistake. And so when I accuse God of, of, of uh, doing or not doing what I'm not supposed to do or to do, that's a category mistake. So uh, God is in a, in a place where he can ordain all of our deaths, where he can ordain all of that, that he is going to flood the world for some kind of a good. And another thing to keep in mind, one thing that Thomas Aquinas, the great philosopher, said is he said that God created this world perfect, that even the evil that is in it, all of it we would call, you know, although the evil itself would say is imperfect, but as a whole, the whole thing is perfect because he created it in proportion to its end, meaning its end as in the end goal. And like your dad said with the debate with uh, um, the, the clip that just pl uh, played with uh, Rabbi Kushner, that he said that if you were to stop a novel in the second chapter and say, well, this isn't going to work out, well, not yet. And so, yeah, it's in proportion to its end, right? And so that would be a category mistake. And also, um, as some of some of our NGI friend, NGIM friends have already said, uh, God doesn't promise us that we're going to have a life where we only have pleasure. He doesn't promise us that. And God is the is the judge. And so when I when I hear of God flooding the world or the plagues, I'm supposed to. My reaction is supposed to be like, well, that's do that. you know my reaction should be like uh like ooh, mufasa you know like from the lion king oh mufasa he's powerful but showing his power but when he does that then by the way we're not saying that the coronavirus again we said this last time we're not saying that's like god's judgment on the world i think it was god's judgment on the world would be much bigger i mean yes. that, you know if god's gonna judge something it's like it's like the uh, global flood but so it ends up being a category mistake it's the assumption that god is supposed to do what we're doing um, and also, uh, this life, as we've, as we said, is, is not the end. And another thing I would recommend the book by Paul Copan called, is God a moral monster? In fact, that's what, probably why you worded it that way. That's a famous book. That's really good where he walks through and he, and he explains that when, if we take what we consider modern, um, present understanding of like slavery for example and we try to impose that onto the biblical text biblical slavery isn't like the american slavery it's just come it's the equivocation fallacy where we assume it's that uh, what happened in the united states it's not the same thing and he explains how it was like an ancient um um almost like welfare type program that if somebody became poor they could become an indentured servant for seven years and then they leave with wealth and so you have to understand that in its entire cultural context and see when it says, what does it mean by a slave? It doesn't mean what happened in the United States, because we know God would be against that. Ultimately, he was in, in this country and also for what happened to the Jews um, in Israel. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Hey, I, I just I mean, in Egypt, not, the Jews in Egypt, I should yeah, say, when they were slaves yeah, in yeah. Egypt, not in Israel. Yeah, yeah. I want to just mention my father has a book. I don't know if you can see this. If God, Why Evil, uh, that he wrote, and it's a very good book, and so I just want our listeners to know about that. They can go to Amazon and check that out. 
Hey, Raymond, let me ask you another question. Um, why, how do we answer the charge that uh, this is one of the things I, I wanted to do at the very beginning, that God is the cause of evil. If God is in charge of everything and uh, he has all power, um, how do we answer that charge, Raymond, that God is the cause of evil? Um, because the Bible seems to suggest that God doesn't cause evil. So how do we answer that? So yes, uh, um, God is the author of everything, including evil in the sense that he permits it, but it's not the uh, cause or um, um, he, he actually uh, created evil, right? So, so evil actually happens in his uh, permissive view that he does not promote evil in his perfect view, right? Uh, according to the book, if, if God, why evil? Uh, page 23, I mean, it was a quote, right? That uh, in Habakkuk uh, 1, 1, it says, God is of purer eyes, to see evil and cannot look at wrong and also in james 1 1 it says let no one says when he's tempted i'm being tempted by god for god cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one yeah and don uh, let me just uh, ask you to add on to that why would god even allow for the possibility of evil and suffering to begin with well, David, I think the, a bigger picture view is needed to really understand that. The, the Bible says that God made everything good. Now, good means that a thing is what it's intended to be, like a good cup holds liquids for us to drink. Now, a cup that has a hole in it, it becomes a bad cup because it does not do what it was intended to do. It is lacking the wholeness and suitability to its purpose that it once had. It has what the early church father Augustine called a privation, a lack. Evil cannot exist unless goodness, and existence is a good thing, existed first. Evil's parasitic. With that in mind, God created mankind to be in relationship with him, not just to exist for his own purpose. Now, kind of like what uh, Thomas said earlier, a lion might eat a man, but we don't call that lion evil. It's just doing what he does. Lions eat things. They're carnivores. But a human made in the image of God has more than a lion. A person has free will. A person can choose to do good or evil. A world with free creatures such as man is better than a world of dumb brutes or robots. Hmm. That is a freely chosen love. Creating a wind-up doll that says, I love you, is completely meaningless. But when your child says, I love you, when they're small, especially, it means the world. And uh, in the case of suffering, if you think of suffering as an evil, it can be a good thing. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Every athlete and every scholar will tell you that their suffering led to a greater good for them. Every doubt that a Christian has when pursued to the correct answer leads to a deeper faith. So not all suffering is bad. So I, I think with a bigger picture view, you, you see that uh, evil is limited and it's parasitic. It's not original and it wasn't created. Thanks for sharing that. Hey, for those of you who are listening and you have some questions and maybe we didn't ask your question yet about the problem of evil, uh, type that out, send that to us uh, in our chat and uh, send that to us. And uh, we, uh, we invite you to uh, do that in the comment section. And um, let me throw out another question that many are asking today. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm just going to throw that one out to anyone who wants to try to answer that. Thomas, maybe you can take a stab at that. Sure, um, especially coming at it from a pastoral standpoint, as many years as I was, I was in ministry, what I found, in, and as a pastor, I've, I've been in hospitals with people in those, in some of their darkest hours, and this question is always brought up. Why did this happen? Uh, which, because when people are asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? There's usually a name and a face that's attached to that. And uh, one of the one of the ongoing discussions I've had with people is, first of all, even if you knew exactly why this bad happened and you knew exactly why, does it make it hurt less? Would it make it hurt less? And the and the answer is no. And people realize. It doesn't. I think in some ways we're we're reacting to the the evil in the world, just like I think with coronavirus. If if anyone has spent any time on social media, uh, everybody has a a grand reaction of all kinds. 
Um, so I, I think the, the question is, um, it, it's one where I think sometimes from the pastoral side, when people ask this, sometimes you just sit with them and help them grieve because we all recognize these things do happen. Knowing why doesn't change it. But I also believe, as uh, and someone else can, can chime in, Christianity has the only solution for that. Exactly. In fact, um, we have a clip from my dad in a debate with Rabbi Kushner uh, when he admitted that this is not the best possible world that God could have created, but he goes on to explain why bad things happen to good people. Let's watch that clip. Norman, is this the best of all possible worlds that we're living in then? I wouldn't say so. I'd have to agree with Candide, who, uh, which is the satire that Voltaire wrote on Leibniz's best of all possible worlds, that this is not the best of all possible worlds, but I think it's the best of all possible ways to get to the best of all possible worlds. Why do you say that? Well, because uh, uh, a true believer is something like uh, tea. Their real strength comes out when they get in hot water. And I think God permits this to happen to us, to produce the greatest virtues in us. As he said in the case of Job, as Job himself admitted, and everyone, including Rabbi Kushner, has admitted that there is this kind of sanctifying influence of suffering that perfects us. Paul, in Romans 5, uh, said, tribulation works patience. There just isn't any way to get to the promised land without going through the wilderness. Certainly, guys, I can identify with that because I feel like with this coronavirus that we're all going through, um, it's bringing some changes in my own life, some really good changes. And one area specifically is in the area of family devotions. I'm much more proactive and trying to be creative and sharing things with my kids, helping them to grow uh, but sharing things in a way that they're going to listen. Um, because growing up, uh, you know, family devotions were basically reading the Bible and praying. And uh, I realize uh, I have to be more interactive uh, with my kids and get them involved in the process. Now, um, certainly the Bible is clear in explaining why moral evil arose. But what about physical evil? <laughs> Guys, how do we explain all the needless physical pain and suffering that we deal with in a world today um, if there's an all good and all powerful God? Brian, how would you answer a question like that? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would say that to know that there is such a thing as needless or purposeless evil, I would be claiming to be omniscient. I'd be claiming I know everything. So I know that there's no plan for this. There's nothing good that can come from this. And certainly we can all think about times in our life when something just horrible happened. And then if that hadn't happened, then the good that came out of it later on, then that wouldn't have happened. And so uh, once again, God is not obligated to have to do what I do as a human, uh, but God is good and he does direct everything towards good. So I would say, first of all, I can't, I don't have access to that knowledge to know that, that there is such a thing as a needless, uh, purposeless suffering. And literally everything actually points straight to God in some way. Even if you have uh, the famous um, critical argument against theism using the problem of, of evil is they'll say, well, what if there's you know, a deer in the forest that's struck by lightning and it suffers, and nobody comes along and 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 ever sees it. It just is just sitting there in pain and and dies. And that's that would be an e a type of evil, like a metaphysical evil for the for that deer. How how could anything good come from that? Well, the the fact that I would even know that such a category exists of uh, of an evil of such an animal dying, that would be in a general category of things are imperfect in this world. And all of that points toward the fact that something has gone wrong, as, as, um, as uh, somebody else already said, that God is telling us something has gone wrong with this world, and we're supposed to figure that out. In fact, I don't think you ever meet anybody that's like, yeah, this is exactly the way things should be. Mm -hmm. Everything's going according to plan. Everybody could tell something went wrong. And the fact that we know that something went wrong means we have this concept of perfection. Mm -hmm. well, where do we get that from? Because we don't have a perfect world. 
but there's something about the finite perfections that we observe and the finite imperfections that we observe that from there we're able to abstract and create this ultimate category perfection itself which mm -hmm. means we know perfection is real well what's the cause of that what's the ground and source of the very notion of perfection it is the one that is the source of perfection god himself and so literally everything points straight to god whether it be a imperfection or perfection so when something goes wrong in my life that still points to god now that's not that's that's a logical explanation that's not going to help me be like okay brian now i understand why i'm <laughs> suffering and going what i'm going right. through and so there's <laughs> um i'm just giving that rational answer but there's also some things that we do personally benefit from when we experience evil so you, a lot of times when somebody would ask that question why is there needless pointless suffering what they mean is how can that evil or suffering benefit me well not everything will necessarily benefit me i mean one day i'm gonna i'm gonna die and hopefully my family will be sad but i'm not gonna be sad over my own death but somebody else will and so from what happened to me god will use that in some way to impact others in in my life but uh one thing that god does promise us and and thomas aquinas actually covered this as well where he talks about the fact that god doesn't promise that good things are coming to everybody that god designed this universe for his people for those who believe uh, as romans 8 28 tells us that all things work for the good of those who love god and so I would say, yeah, if somebody is not a believer, they're not going to, to um, reap the benefits of all the things that happen mm -hmm. in, in this life. And so if somebody's listening and you're not a believer, I would say, yes, go to the Lord. I mean, all the things that happen, good and bad, all of it, God can use that to do something in you, right. to produce a greater good in you if you are 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 a believer because uh it points directly to god it tells us something went wrong and it perfects your character that if, if you think about how people treated you somebody treated you uh badly in school what good could come from that mm -hmm. where you're gonna think i'm not gonna treat anybody like that guy did and so it makes you a better person and when you go if you think of the people in your life that you know that really have just superb moral character are they people who have suffered and gone through the fire or are they people who have had everything handed to them? Everything's been wonderful. Mm. It's usually people who have really been pressed and squeezed. Like your dad said that the hot water's there and it pulls something out of you, but it's also strengthens you and, and imparts something into you also that you actually really do become a better person. That if you think about the suffering that you've gone through in life during it, you're going to be like, yes this should I, I this should not be happening mm. but afterwards the what you learned from it how it made you a better person right. you want to keep that don't you well how long does that stay with you well, when when the good that comes to you from enduring suffering how long does that good stay with you forever forever right it always stays with you but how long did the evil itself last it's a little bit of time. Yeah, it's temporal. And so when you think of it from God's perspective, if, if you see it as the, you know, we live maybe 80 years or so, life expectancy is somewhere around there in the United States, uh, but we have a global audience. So wherever it is in your, in your country, right. one day I'm going to die. Um, but what I learned from this world, like your dad talked about, the two world scenario, the two world scenario, this world and the next world, when combined, that is the greatest possible route to the greatest possible good. A trillion years from now, I am still going to have the goods that have accrued to me because of the suffering that I've gone to. And also learning from your story and everybody else's story during it, you're never going to be like, Oh yeah, this makes sense. This is how it should be. It's awful. But the good that comes from God's perspective, he sees it as a trillion years from now, a hundred trillion years from now, a quadrillion years from now, you're, you're going to understand why, and you're going to forever have that good imparted into you. And that's what God's after. It's not what I'm after. I want a world where I never suffer. Yes. And I remember Paul says, these light momentary afflictions are yeah. yielding for us an eternal weight of glory far right. beyond comparisons. And his 
sufferings were not light and momentary. Let me tell you, right, uh, beatings in, and in the book of Second Corinthians, you see all the things that he went through, um, and uh, it just it's a great perspective to keep in mind. Don, let me go to you. You know, my father mentions in this book, uh, If God, Why Evil, some of the causes for physical evil in the world. But I think maybe what some of our listeners want to know is, as it relates to the coronavirus, like why is God allowing all this suffering of this coronavirus to cause all this pain and destruction and suffering all around our world today? David, if you don't mind, I'll answer the physical evil first, and then I'll move on to the second part. Okay. Uh, physical or, or natural evil is a result of two causes. The fall of man, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, contributes to it. I can't tell you exactly how because the Bible's not explicit, but it is the fall. Uh, and the limitations of a finite physical creation. Uh, just think about it. If you're designing a car and I asked you, what's a perfect car? One person might say a car that accelerates really fast. Another person might say a very comfortable ride. Another car person might say a car that gets great gas mileage. Another car person might say a car that's really safe. Well, you can't put all those things into one vehicle and to make it affordable. That that's just isn't impossible. So there's limitations just by being a finite physical world. Uh, and, and for physical evil, for example, like plate tectonics does much more good than, than harm. Uh, because of plate tectonics, it recycles the CO2 in the atmosphere, which acts to maintain the temperature of the surface of Earth. Without it, without plate tectonics, uh, the earth would be uninhabitable in a short period of time. Temperature would run away. And number two, it contributes to the earth's magnetic fields, which present most of the sun's radiation from destroying physical life. So if you want runaway cancer, or if you want to uh, have the earth's temperature run away, then, then, then get rid of, uh, get rid of plate tectonics. Well, the negative side of that is if you live in near a fault line, then there's going to be earthquakes when there's adjustments and shifts and, and there can be life. But now you, uh, you talk about uh, uh, the virus. Uh, the, let's, let's put this in perspective again. The word virus is a scary word, but of the 100 million viral types on earth, the vast majority contribute through our well-being through helping to recycle inorganic materials. That is, most of them uh, contribute to our well-being. There's 21 out of about 100 million viruses that do us harm, and the rest of them help us. Are you going to get rid of the ones that help us to process food, etc.? Not just bacteria in our stomach. I'm talking virus, specifically viral compounds and such that uh, break down food and such. And out of 100 million, 21 are harmful. So uh, there's going to be that. But you all, you also brought up the the other side of the question, which is the more the moral question, the personal question of you. And we don't know for sure at this point, but there, there's probably at least some moral evil component to this as well. We do know that there was a cover up and a lack of sharing of information by the Chinese government, especially at the beginning of this. There's even the possibility that the virus originated as a laboratory experiment and then got away that wasn't contained properly. Either way, we know for certain that the humans who run the governments of the world are not without blame in this. Mm -hmm. The free choice of humans played a major role in this pandemic. And mm -hmm. uh, if there's something else from your father that, uh, that I missed out on there, feel free to enlighten me. But uh, otherwise, I think that there's there both the natural evil part that comes from right. the physical limitations of the universe and the moral part from man's contributions. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Hey, Thomas, we got a, a few questions now. So let me just uh, throw one out to you that uh, uh, similar to the question actually I was going to ask you. What was the point in God creating opposition to himself? Didn't he, uh, did he need it? In other words, when he created Satan, um, you know, why would he even create someone like Satan? Well, when he created Satan, he created him good. Uh, all of his creation was good. And as already has been mentioned, God didn't create evil as a thing in opposition to himself. That's more of the concept of dualism. We were talking about theistic perspective earlier. 
Uh, dualism is another idea that there's these two opposing forces, almost like the light and the dark side of the force, and they're always in opposition. Well, God didn't do that. When he created, he didn't create the universe, and he said, you know, and, and it mostly was good, but oops, on that one over there. You know, he, it was, there was a corruption that entered in, and I think also tagging along with, uh, it was God a more monster of the Old Testament, keep in mind that as even humans fell, as Satan fell, as, as Adam and Eve sinned, as Cain sinned, God could have obliterated them, but he did not destroy his creation because the creation did not cease being good. The creation had become corrupt. And so, uh, especially Adam and Eve, we look at them, they were uh, cast out of the garden. He could have destroyed them, completely obliterated mankind, started over, but he didn't. He showed mercy because he has a redemption in mind. So could God destroy all evil as some sort of, you know, since it's opposed to him, he could, but I think it's his mercy that stays his hand, as Peter says, that he's not slow in acting as some people count slowness that he desires at all come to repentance. And uh, I think that says a lot about the, the character of God and, and our need for patience in this. Well, and, and the fact that God created a world where there's a possibility of people to choose the bad uh, allows us to eventually kind of finalize that choice. As Matthew 13, the parable of the weed and the tares talk about, uh, you allow the potential for good and evil to grow up together and then separate it. And so God allowing Satan, uh, creating Satan good, but then him choosing to go evil actually works to our benefit as well. So in other words, the best possible world is not a world where evil is not a possibility. The best possible world is where evil is a possibility and ultimately people make a choice for good and then there's a quarantine of evil and a separation of good and evil and i think there's a lot of people that, that don't understand that and uh, i think that's why I, that was a very good uh, question it, there's uh, another question that someone just uh, mentioned here um, if god is an invisible spirit why would he be interested in the problem of human beings. Does anyone want to tackle that one? Don, why don't you? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's not like God's a being like us, only invisible. It's not just being spiritual. It's not like he's on our level, part of the creation. God, God is the ground of all being. God is the is the anchor that allows our existence. He created us, and he created us with a purpose and uh, his laws for us reflect his nature. Mm. When the Bible says God is, you know, love as God is love, and it talks about God is good. God doesn't have goodness like we do partially and as, as added to us. God is goodness. God is love. So uh, his, his complete, his plan for us and his love for us necessitates that he's involved with us. Yeah, that's true. Here's another good question just came in. Why is God letting good people suffer and die? That's that's a hard one. Who, who would like to take a stab at that one? Uh, Brian? Go ahead, Brian. Basically, uh, for uh, what, kind of what we've been talking about is all, the, all things that are happening in this world are pointing us toward God. And so... Um, I may, when, I, when we say that we're good people, what we mean is, I guess, relative to, you know, people in prison or something like that. And God, we learned from in the book of Job that God didn't promise Job that you're going to have a life where there's no suffering at all. And Job actually said, I know that when this is all done, that I will come forth as pure gold, that God did something in Job by having him go through the, what he did. And so, again, all of this, everything points toward God that it tells us that God exists because we learn what goodness is, that something has gone wrong. And then we also learn what kind of God exists, that he is the ground of existence, of being itself, and he's doing something to get our attention. That if, if, since we have free will, what could God do to let us know something has gone wrong without overriding our free will? 
well, he could make a world like he did and then stand back and let things kind of collapse so that we realize, hmm, something seems to have gone wrong. And this is where we as Christians will come in if we're talking to our unbelieving friends and say, you know, do you think that things are going how they're supposed to? And they're, they're not going to say yes. They're going to say, no, they're not. Then that's when you would say, well, where do you think we get this idea of supposed to? Right. It seems like things are uh, have gone wrong, but in order to know they've gone wrong, then there must have been a way that was right. So what that means is we're designed to discover this idea of perfection and right and wrong and good and evil, and that we're directed toward that and to desire that things be fixed. And so who could we go to that could maybe fix it? Right. The one that is goodness, the one that is perfection, the one that is the ground of all of it. And so that's the way that God can point us to him without actually overriding our, our freedom. Right. Um, and in the process, we learn about goodness and can help us to become good and, and that sort of thing. So I, I would say that, yeah, that the righteous often, or the right, everybody suffers. Right. That that's part of the fall, that that tells us something went wrong. And that's part of the biblical worldview, that if I don't have the uh, Christian worldview, how am I, how, how else would you explain evil that something went wrong? Yes. You know, and I just remember what we were talking about two weeks ago. I, I mentioned that C.S. Lewis has this famous quote that God whispers to us in his pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. So pain is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. And let's be honest, um, we are deaf. Uh, this world is deaf to a lot of the things that God had been shouting out uh, to them. And God then uses all these kinds of things uh, to kind of get our attention. Anybody else want to add anything to what we said about this? Raymond, do you have any thoughts? So I'm thinking that um, when we when we assume that why God allow good uh, bad things happens to good people, we're assuming that the world is all that we see and everything ends when somebody dies, right? But actually, as as uh, as what your father say, right? This world is not the the best possible world, but it's the best possible way to the best possible world. So if we look at it this way, you know, after we have died, right? Although we never. We never see, you know, uh, the good people get rewarded at the end of the life. But, you know, in, in God's, God's uh, overall infinite plan in the history, because it's all powerful and because it's all good and it's all knowing, he will uh, definitely reward those that who is faithful to him. And for those bad guys, right, I mean, he, he will come after him at some point in time where we can't see it. That's very good. Here's another good question. Um, how can I get through this incredibly difficult time and maintain my faith in God? Wow, that's a good one. Who wants to take a stab at that? And Don? I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, now, how to maintain We're your faith? We're struggling with that one, aren't we? I'm sorry? <laughs> We're all struggling with that one to some degree. Uh, to some degree, everybody has to answer the question, how can you believe in a good God and a world gone bad? There's no doubt about that. And it's not, it, it, you know, as we talked before, there's the uh, logical question, and then there's the existential question, the how do we live our lives? I, I suspect this question is more along the existential question since, since uh, we've already discussed the logical several times today. So I, I'm going to say that uh, reaching out to a community of believers at a time when you're struggling, not being a Lone Ranger Christian, the Bible says, don't forsake the gathering of the saints. Don't, just because you can't physically be with them, uh, find ways through to communicate. There's, there's all sorts of video chatting available. There's, there's, there's your own family to communicate with. There's a, a way to share your load, share your burden, ask others, call them up, ask them if you can pray for them and ask them to pray for you. It'll, it'll get through this. Uh, every, every darkness we see, we know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're not like the atheists for whom every day could be the last second the universe exists. The, you know, the, uh, a, a, a meteor or a gamma ray blast from somewhere could extinguish life. And that would be it as far as they're concerned. 
Uh, we, we have hope and that's what makes us different. But I would really very, very much suggest that they share that burden with others. And uh, I, I personally am gonna pray for that person uh, when we finish this broadcast. Great, great. Um, I have one other question that I wanna talk about tonight before we end our discussion. But if you are watching us right now and have any further questions, keep, keep them coming. Uh, we'll do everything we can to, to answer them uh, even after the show. And just wanna let you know, we're offering two free workshops right now through Norm Geisler Institute. Uh, Thomas McCuddy is the director of the Norm Geisler Institute. He's got some great programs he's developed uh, in combination with some of the materials that my father has left. Um, knowing God that expresses who God is and what a God is like and essential theology, which asks the question, what does Christianity really teach? And these links to these free workshops are in the description and you can just click on those. Uh, if you're interested in learning more what my father said about evil, as I mentioned, he's got this book called If God, Why Evil? Uh, and also there's a video lecture he gave at Rick Warren's church, Saddleback, uh, that are in the description as well. And in my opinion, this free video that you can just click on and, and watch, I think you have to go about 20 or 30 minutes in, into the video before my dad speaks, but I think it's one of the best videos he's ever done on the question of God and evil. And so I'd encourage you to, to look at that um, I want to close by asking uh, this kind of question, and maybe all of us can kind of think about this. How can we use this crisis to point people to Jesus for the spiritual virus that has infected them in more serious ways than they even realize? I'm just going to throw this out to everyone, and anyone can answer that who would like to start. Yeah, Thomas? So I think um, as, as people are experiencing lockdown all over the world, uh, they're finding themselves asking a lot of questions and thinking about things in ways that they, they may not have had that, that opportunity. And um, I think this is where I know even in my own family that where people have been so busy and so caught up in their lives and so caught up in the stuff, I think many people are finding they don't have that anymore. And I think that allows us to, to ask that question, you know, if, if, if all these things are taken, mm. what do we have? And I, I think that's why within not just theism, but Christianity, that if everything is taken, including our own life in this world, we still win. Right. And uh, that's why I, I've, I've even compared it. People say, well, you know, uh, you know, even when they get sick, and, and I know people have lost loved ones, and I, I know people who specifically have, have lost family members to this, and so we don't minimize that suffering. We grieve with them, and I think that's um, also where we show that Christian love. We show the good that Jesus has brought in our lives, and I think in some ways we help endure because we have, as believers, we have a hope, and I think we need to manifest that Yes. in this time and not join in despair but to say you know we too suffer we struggle but we know that there is th that the best is yet to come and i yeah. think that if we communicate that to people uh we we don't just point them to jesus i think we also walk with them in that sense so man that's really great hey raymond i know living in asia you, you have to approach people in different ways how would you answer this question I think in Asia, people look at your action more than words. Uh, recently, there's a case, my, my colleague working with me, he got the uh, coronavirus, so he was confirmed and hospitalized. And I actually have a meeting with him, actually. So uh, I was actually called up by contact tracing. And, uh, you know, others also called up by him. Then a lot of people really panicking. And just that, I think that I, I feel that in this kind of moment if we if we're exposed to the virus and i think that uh, god gave uh, christians uh, extra you know peace 
that we can actually demonstrate to the others that, I mean, our, our God is different from them and we, we don't need to panic because we know that he's in control. And by living a, a, a great <coughs> testimony of Jesus, it will actually help us to reach out to those that, uh, I mean, although they, they might not listen to, to our words, right, but by, by, by seeing our reaction, by seeing our responses to this situation, they will know that, uh, hey, He's a Christian and he, he got something different in, in his life. And you know that I, I even got my, my, my colleagues, right, that once the news was broken in the, in the company, people start calling me and say, oh, I panic, you know, do you know where the guy went to and all that. that all, this, all these people, they don't have a theistic worldview. They, they're all very worried and they're all very panicked. But just that, I mean, I mean, slow down. Can I pray for you? And also reach out to the patient that I pray for them. And this is a perfect time for us to show Christian love to others. Yeah, because uh, probably people won't read the Bible, but we Christians maybe don't need Bible that other reads. Right, right. You know, I think this is a great time to help people understand the seriousness of their problem with their creator. Um, one of the things that happened to me a couple years ago is I was in Dominican Republic and uh, my taxi driver asked me this question. He said, did you hear what happened in Vegas the other day? And that was um, in 2017 with the sniper shooting. And I realized when he asked that question, I had an opportunity to move the conversation in a spiritual direction and actually share the gospel with this taxi driver. So I said, yeah, that's, that's really tragic. How you know people can do things like that. Then I asked him this question: What do you think is the source of this kind of evil? And to my surprise, he said, Well, it probably has something to do with the fact that we're all sinners and we need Christ. Now, it turns out my taxi driver was an evangelical Christian for 25 years, but let's just say this taxi driver wasn't a Christian. And I just want to ask our, our listeners. Do you know what you would say next to move the conversation in a spiritual direction? I think we need to learn how to do this. So let me just share with you how I would have done this had he not been a Christian. My next question would have been something like this. Do you think it's possible that what it says in the Bible about mankind could possibly be true? And then my follow-up question would be something like this. Do you realize that our problem isn't just that we're capable of committing the same kind of crimes of evil people like Hitler or ISIS or bin Laden or the sniper. Our problem is much worse. Our problem is no matter how much good we do, it's never going to be enough to get us off the hook with our problems with our creator. Do you realize that we are accountable to our creator in some way? And then I would build a bridge to the gospel based on the five planks principles that our ministry teaches. I'm accountable. I don't measure up. I'm a sinner. I need an outside source for help. And I need what only Jesus can provide. And we have a little bookmark. You can go to our website, ngim.org, front page. And you can download that little bookmark just to remind you of all the ways that we can reach out to others and uh, help people understand there's a more serious virus uh, that needs our att uh, attention. Um, we are all accountable to our creator in some way. Now, guys, this has been a great discussion tonight. I'm looking forward to our next one uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, in two weeks' time. How do we as followers of Christ make the most of the time we have left when it's safe for us to talk to people face to face? And I would encourage everyone to come and join us again and bring your questions. And we'll have a lot more time for questions. Um, I think it's time for us to make a difference. What is it time for us to do specifically? Um, remember, it's time to put Christ first. Good night.